How you doing? Well, you know it's all bad. Nothing's good in my life. If I'm seeking him, it's not by might nor power. It's by his spirit. It is his problem. It is his way. He's going to handle it. It's all about what you want. That's the way we are right now. We only want what we want. Therefore, we never get to the promised lands in our life. We never get to the hope in the future because it's always about what we want. Somebody say amen. Please take a seat. Take a seat. My God in heaven, this is beautiful. Man, you guys are powerful. <sighs> Lead me to the rock. That's who we've been singing about, Jesus, the rock. That's today's message. Lead me to the rock. And I just want to start off by saying a, such a beautiful, familiar scripture that I believe after, after we're done here, it's going to make a lot more sense to you. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, the plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. That's Jeremiah 29, 11. It's, it's beautiful to speak that because there is so much in God that we need to keep our eyes on. He, he's like, listen... It, he says, I know the plans I have for you. I got a hope and a future planned for you. But what you need to understand is when you enter with your books and your backpack and all your stress and, and, and your minds and you enter into the university for the first time and you say, I am going to medical school. You don't say, I'm a doctor. So when he says the plans I have for you are hope in a future that's contingent based on whether who he's driving the car or you're driving it. Amen. He knows the plan, but plans can be changed by man. God's plan never changes. He's not man that he should change his mind, but we change his mind for him. And when we do that, we suffer the consequences. But if you can just come to the understanding that he's already got everything mapped out, then you understand what he needs you to do. And that's Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. I love it how it says, the Lord said to Abram, who later on became Abraham. He changed his name. Here's what, here's what directs the hope in the future for you. It says, go from your country, your people, your father's household to the land that I'm going to show you. I'm going to ask you to do something that's not going to make sense. I'm not going to, I'm going to ask you to just, to just, to just literally go completely against the flow of what you understand. And if you do that, then a hope and a future awaits you. But what we do is we begin to panic as soon as things don't go right. And we decide to go, but the way we want to go, not where God wants to go. Because he says, go from, from your comfort zone. From your country. He says, go from your people, your family. Go from your father's household, your immediate family. He says, and then what I need you to do is I need you to go where I'm going to show you to go. So you're asking me to leave my house, my country, my family, my children, and my, my father's household. In other words, where I, where I grew up. And you're telling me to go somewhere that I have no idea where I'm going to go. And yet, at the same time, you're going to give me a hope and a future. Well, he goes on to say this. Listen. I knew you were going to say that, so I thought I'd say more. Verse 2, he says, I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. He's starting to show Abram his hope and his future. He says, I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I'm, I'm telling you what I'm going to do. I'm selling this program for you so that you take it. I'm selling this bait so you taste it. But then in your mind, in a human mind, is we always begin to worry about what's going to happen when the world comes against us. And I'm talking to somebody right now on the broadcast, maybe somebody in here. What about when my world is coming against me? What about when people are coming against me? What about when all my issues are coming, you know, cash due and balloon payment at one time? He goes on to say this in verse 3. God says, oh, and don't worry, Abram. As long as you do what I ask you to do, whether it makes sense or not, I will bless those who bless you. In other words, those that bless you, I'm going to bless them. It's going to encourage them to even bless you more. But he says this right here. He says, and whoever curses you, I'll curse them. I don't even need you to fight. I don't need you to worry about who's coming around you. I just need you to go where I ask you to go. I need you to follow me. 
I need you to take your eyes off of your ability and put it completely on my ability. And he says, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. He has just sold them the hope and the future, just like he's done it to you too. He has given every one of you a hope and a future. But he's, there's going to be a go in your world. And sometimes it's the go away from this lifestyle to this lifestyle. Go away from these people to this people over here. Stop doing this and start doing this. It doesn't make sense. It's your comfort zone. But he's telling you, I need you to leave. Well, well I, I have a nice family. What do you no, no. Sometimes he wants you to move out of the house and burn it down. And I'm not talking about your physical house. Those watching online, I'm not talking physical. I'm talking about... <laughs> I'm talking about the house of worry that, go, that lives right here. And he says, I need you to burn the house of worry because anything that wants to curse you, I will curse. But if it wants to bless you, I will bless it. You know, God has, God has got you so taken care of. This is a true story. I was like nine or 10 years old. And I loved playing baseball. That's all I knew. And so I would go down to this field that was behind our house. And it, I mean, my, literally, you could, you could, look out my, my garage window of my, fam- my parents' house, and you could see the ball field. So I would go there. I was only nine years old, and in those days, your parents would let you go places by yourself because you'd come home. So I, <laughs> I went to the ball field, and there were all these old people playing Indian ball. Now, you probably don't even know what Indian ball is, but it's kind of, it's not, they're too old to play softball. They had to play Indian ball. So in other words, you got a pitcher and a batter, and then people scattered throughout the field, and the ball goes at certain levels. If you catch it on a fly, you're out. If it gets past you, it's a, it's a, it's a point, you know, stuff like that. So I would sit there on the field, on this little wall, all by myself, with about 10, 12 of these old guys playing Indian ball. And I'd sit there and kick my feet. Every Saturday, I would go watch them play. I was only 9 years old, 10 years old the most. And they'd sit there, and some of the, the wisecrackers from the outfield, they'd be, they'd be saying, watch this one, kid. This guy can't hit. And you're talking to me, you know, ragging on each other, but they're throwing it my way. They don't know who I am. They don't even know who I am. So 12 years later, I'm walking down the aisle at the church to marry my wife. And the people at the ball field was her dad, her uncle, her, bro- her, her cousin, her, her uncle's uh, cousins and relatives, they, they didn't live in my area. They lived 10, 12 miles the other direction. Why did they end up in that field right there? Sometimes you can't see the hand of God until he delivers you the package. And then you can look back and say, he had his eye on me the whole time to get me to here. Now he will have his eye on me to take me the rest of the way. Amen. Somebody say, lead me to the rock. So I thought that was amazing how God had set that up all, all those years that his, his dad would say, you know, my wife's dad would be there, and you know, I, now if I looked back, I would have expected him to walk up to me and says, maybe you can help her. I can't do nothing for her. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why I said that. I'm sorry. Forgive me, Lord. Send me down there with the pygmies in South America. I heard somebody say that once. Anyway, so God has a plan for you even when you can't see it. You, you, he's got a plan for you right now for 20 years down the road. And some of you watching right now, some of you want to just end life because you can't see tomorrow when God's already got the map out for the next 20 years. You got to just let him do it. You just have to leave your comfort zone of misery and go to the new place he's showing you because his hope and his future's got your name on it. Amen. Amen. But we don't do that because we jump ship. James chapter 4 is the best j- ship jumping. You got to be careful how you say that. Is the the <laughs> Watch yourself, Jojo. It's the best ship jumping scripture there is in the Bible. Matthew chapter 4, verse 13 says, now watch what James says here. He says, now listen. He's not not playing games here. He's looking you right in the eyes, and he's saying, now listen. I got to tell you something that's going to help you out. He says, now listen, you who say. Now listen, those of you that think you got your life figured out. Now listen, those of you that got the plan of the future. Now, I'm not telling you, scratches. Back. I'm not telling you to not have goals and plans. We're not talking about that. We're talking about, just listen, it'll explain itself. He says, listen, you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to do this or that in this city. We will go and spend a year there, carry on business and make money. That's what we're going to do. We, don't, our, we didn't even console God about that stuff yet. 
We're just going to go and do it. Matter of fact, Lord, I don't even know where you're going. Give me that map. I'll find it myself. That's what we do. And James is here saying, why? You don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. You're trying to, you don't even know if there's even road at the end of where you're, where you're traveling. You don't know what's going on. He says, he says, what is your life? You're only a mist that appears for a little while and then you vanish. Instead, if you want the hope in the future, if you want the plan that God has for you, instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Man, you don't even know how much trouble you're going to save yourself if you just understand the rule book right here. It saves you a lot of pressure. He goes on to say, as it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. And if anyone knows the good that they ought to do and doesn't do it, well, then it's sin for them. So God's saying, listen, you, you, you know what you need to do. See, some people out there right now, you're like, no, I don't know what I need to do. Because it's been so displaced. We've had our eyes on everything but God. We've got our eyes on the whole world and whatever somebody in, in, in any kind of power tells us, well, they said it. Well, who's they? Is they over Jesus? No. So when they tells you you have to do this or that, you need to go back to the rule book and say, let me say this. Lord, I'm not sure if this is what I'm supposed to do, but I need you to tell me if it's this or that. Well, how do I know he's going to answer me? Listen, once you consult the Lord, you just go until you see red. You, if you're colorblind and all you can see is red on a, on a, on a light, you know, you can't see yellow, you can't, you can't distinguish yellow from green from red, you just know red, but you can't tell yellow and green. Don't worry about it. You just go until you see red, then you hit the brakes. Oh, you didn't hear me when I said that. You can, I, got, I got this covered. You, God says, if you just ask me for help, I will show you where to go. But you don't, I don't hear you because he's going to lead you. He's, it, it's an unction, and you just keep going until you see red. And when you see red, hit the brakes, and then what do I do? Well, you may have to wait another six months. Oh, I don't want to wait six months. I ordered my burger at the first window. I'm ready to pick it up at the second window. That's why you're going to get just a burger. Amen? Sometimes you got to wait because that's what he says to do. I didn't write this. It's him. Amen? So let's watch now. Watch this. I like this. Miracles are everywhere. God is talking to you all over the place. You're just not seeing it because you're waiting to see a thundercloud and a voice that sounds like Charlton Heston, and you're just not seeing it. But he's everywhere. He's all over. In the midst of the 10 to 12 guys on this baseball field when I was 10 years old, there was this one guy. He's the oldest of them all, and he's, he's gone. He's with Jesus now. He was always happy. It was Terry's, it was Terry's uncle's wife's father. Who cares? Anyway, his name was Joe. Good name. So this guy was always happy all the time. And every time I would see him at the family functions, he's always happy. He was the life of the party. He would just sit there and everybody would be around listening to him talk. And he always talked with a big smile on his face. And I said, I, this guy doesn't have any problems. He didn't have any problems. Everything's perfect. I want a life like that. That's the life I want right there. And then I realized as I grew up and got older, I realized he does have problems, but they were his, not mine. Amen? So I said, you know what? That miracle was in my life when I was a kid so that I could see that that's what I want to be like. I want to be a person that is joyful and makes other people's life better rather than bring them to my miserable world. Then I added to it as I found Jesus, and I realized the reason I'm like this is because my problem is not your problem, and the reason that my problem is not your problem is because it's not even my problem. Yeah. It's his problem. Yeah. If I'm seeking him, it's not by might nor power. It's by his spirit. It is his problem. It is his way. He's going to handle it. I am going to take a nap, God. Tell me when we get there. And if you can understand that right there, you just took the weight load of the world off of your shoulder and put it back on God. Amen? Man. So anyway, where was I? Now, I told you that God has a plan for you. I told you you got to follow God's plan. I told you that sometimes we try to get in God's way. Now I'm going to tell you how God fights for your plan. Watch this. Sometimes it's the people he puts in your life. That's why you got to be careful who you hang with. You can't be hanging out with people that are going to keep pulling you down to their world. 
They all, every time you get together with them, they want to tell you what's going on in their life. How you doing? Oh, so I, there's a guy I work out with. He's a doctor. I says, let me tell you something. We got to get through this workout in a half an hour. Once people come up to you, don't you say how you doing because they're going to tell you and I don't have time for that. <laughs> how you doing? Well, you know it's all bad. Nothing's good in my life. Um, stocks are down. I went from 10.5 million to six. Well, doop de hoo Dear God, give up a hamburger. Wait a minute. I want to show you something. Come up here, Zephyr and uh, Patrick. You guys just stand right there. I'm going to show you what God does for you. I'm going to bless you right now. Mm. Say the word. word. Say the word. word. It's going to bless me right now. Watch this. Got to watch the meatballs you hang out with, all right? You ready for this? All right. We can't experience a hope and a future unless we trust God, and we can't trust God if our visuals that are around us are doing nothing but dragging us down. We need to lift each other up with a hope and a future. So watch this now. Exodus chapter 17, verse 12. I love what, what uh, Moses and Aaron and her did. See, there was, these, there was this organization, and they were called the Amalekites, and Joshua was told to go fight the Amalekites. And so Moses' job, because he was kind of old, he needed to go up on the hill and he needed to just sit, stand there and lift his hands. And when he lifted his hands, everything was cool. But when he put his hands down, the battle was lost. So I'll pick it up with verse 12. It says this, when Moses' hands grew tired, they took the stone and they put it under him and they sat him on it. So let me, let me, let me show you a visual here. Watch this. Okay, I'm sitting here and... They, Amalekites are coming to destroy Israel. People are coming to destroy your life. The enemy sets ambush on you. He prowls the earth daily looking for one of you to devour, one of you who doesn't have your hands up. So here we go. Got the hands up like this. Well, let me tell you something. A battle doesn't happen in five minutes. This is going to get old real fast and tired because it's called, we got something on this earth called gravity, and it pulls us like this. So when it's tired, if you don't have people around you that are doing what God needs to do, then you're going to drop your hands right here like this, you see. But when you have godly people in your life, then they're going to come on either side of you. And when your hand is going like this and the battle starts to lose, they're going to pick it back up again. Now, they're going to hold it here because it's about 10 hours now. And I'm like, I'm like this. Look, I'm like this, you see? So now they're getting tired. So what they do is they take me and they put me on a rock. And they have me sit on something that is stable. Now, my hands are up. Now they don't have to work so hard. They were holding me and my hands up. Now they're just holding this up right here. But it is my determination that says I don't want to put my hands down that causes the people around me to help me keep them up. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Watch this now. Watch this. Do me a favor. Sit on that chair. Plop on it. Just give it a plop. Good. Get up. That's a big boy. That's 230 pounds of big boy. Okay, here. Sit down on this chair. Just plop. Okay, stand up. All right. This chair was made in China. Do you know who made it? Do you know who made that chair? Me neither. Why'd you sit on it then? How'd you know it was going to hold you? You didn't. You trusted a piece of metal and a bunch of people in another country that's going to make this chair so you don't fall and break your neck. You just trusted it. You plopped. That's 230 pounds times velocity, speed, and gravity, which is what? Kimmy, come on. You're a math guy. What is it? Yeah, it's a lot. Good. Now, I'll do the math. You're too slow today. Now, watch this. Plop again. I want you to plop. Don't think about it. Just plop. Come on. Get up. Get up. You don't know how to plop. Plop. Look, look, look. Plop. Now, come on. Give it a plop. Plop goes the weasel. There you go. That's a plop. Now, when you can put your trust into what man can make, why don't you put your trust in the one who made the man that made it? Amen? So when it says right here in the word of God, it says right here, it says, um, so Joshua came over the Amalekites. He overcame the Amalekites with the sword. Oh my gosh, this is amazing. How God put Moses in charge to do nothing more than just lift his hands. Come on, come on. I'm tired. Now, lead me to the rock. Lead me to what won't fail. Lead me to what will hold me. Lead me to what will sustain me. Lead me to what's going to pick me up. Lead me. Lead me to the rock. Amen. When you know who the rock is, 
then you can be led to it. But if you're hanging around with a bunch of meatballs, they're going to lead you to a let's get your mind off of it. Well, your mind is getting off it, but when your mind is off it, you put your hands down. Okay, don't get ahead of me. Would you stop, please? Watch this now. Moses built an altar and called it, the Lord is my banner. He said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord. It's because the enemy lifted its hand against God's people. Did I not say that back in the beginning? I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. He's, he's filling it out now. He's, he's making it happen just like he said he would do. Watch this. He says this right here. Hands were lifted against the throne of God's people. People, you're trying to follow a God, but it's got to make sense to you. You can't have a God that makes sense to you because he's bigger than you. Amen. He says, I'll take you, I want you to leave this, I want you to leave them, and I want you to go here, and I want you to do this. It doesn't make any sense. And on your journey, people are going to come and attack you, and you're going to get tired, and you're going to get real tired, and your hands are going to fall, and boom. You see, watch this. Put me on the rock. What is the big deal about the hands? This is what I didn't understand for a long time. What's the big deal about the hands? Watch this, watch this. Where am I? When when, when the enemy puts its hands up against you, God says, put your hands towards me. If you want me to fight the battle, then take your eyes off of who's coming against you and put them on me. Now, if you put your hands down, you're telling me you can handle it. Oh, my God, this is so good. You preach. I'm going to go sit and listen. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? If your hands are up, he's fighting. If you put them down, you're fighting. So if you're hanging around a bunch of meatballs that are going to take your hands and lead you over to the nearest, get your mind off of it, then you put your hands down because they have helped you put your hands down. But it's when you are down going, nothing is going to help me. I hate my life. I hate everything about it. There is no hope. I'm going to be destroyed. My family's destroyed. My wife, I can't stand. My husband, I can't stand. Everything's going miserable in my life. And he comes over here and he says, come on, Joe, put your hand up. Put your hand up, Joe. Come on. I can't. I can't. I've been fighting this battle for years, man. You have no idea. My wife nags so much at me. Oh, Lord, help me. Oh, help me. I'm not speaking the truth. That's just a metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> Who's in your camp? Are they leading you to the rock so that you can rest on it? Or are they leading you to a place where they're going to use a rock to hit you in the head with it? Are you following what I'm saying? I told you he's got a plan for you. I told you his plan means do what he says, not what makes sense to you. And I told you, you can't do it because, you know, we're going to go do this or that. No, you ask God, if this is what you want me to do, I will go do this or that. And then he says, just lift your hands towards me and I will fight the battle for you. Regardless of what the battle is, he'll fight it. Thank you, boys. I appreciate that. Now, let me close the ship down. Watch this. I love this part. Hold on a second. Ooh, Jesus. Matthew chapter 16, verse 22. Matthew chapter 16, verse 22. Peter took him aside. See, Jesus told the apostles he was going to suffer. He was going to be crucified. Peter didn't like it. Didn't make sense to Peter. He was enjoying Jesus. See, sometimes it's hard for us to follow Jesus because he's telling us to, do, to stop doing something we want to keep doing. Lord, Lord, Lord. So Peter took Jesus aside. Can, can you imagine the king of the universe? Come here. Come here. Come on. Come on, Jesus. Let's go. Come on, Jesus. Let's go. Stop healing that person. They don't deserve it anyway. Come on. Come on. Pulls Jesus aside, and this is what he says to him. He rebukes him. The word rebuke means to express a sharp disapproval. You just told all 11 of my dearest friends who have been following you and serving you and everyone else that is listening, you just told them you're going to die and then you're going you're gonna to raise again. Come, stop that nonsense. Nobody does that, Jesus. Stop it. But Jesus is a loving God. He sits there and he listens to your baloney. It has a first name. My baloney has a first name. Now, let's go into the second, verse 23. Jesus turned to Peter after he got done watching Peter make the bologna sandwich. He said this to him, simple, you, 
get behind me, Satan. Whoa. Peter was not talking. Jesus was not talking to Peter. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. The king of darkness is coming against your mind right now, so I'm going to speak to the king of darkness. Why do you want to fight Satan when Jesus will do it for you? He said, get behind me, Satan. I'm not talking to you, Peter. I'm talking to the one that's talking through you right now. I have authority over that. Watch what he says here. Watch this. Get behind me, Satan. He says, you are a stumbling block to me. Now he's talking to Peter. He says, you do not have in mind the concern of God, but merely human concern. It's all about what you want. That's the way we are right now. We only want what we want. Therefore, we never get to the promised lands in our life. We never get to the hope in the future because it's always about what we want. Somebody say amen. Amen. I'm sweating up here. Somebody say amen. amen. That's good. Now, how can Peter, how can Peter be the same one that Jesus says through that revelation, my father spoke to you, I'm gonna build my church on that. And then just moments later says, get behind me, Satan. Who is in him? He needs an exorcist. (laughs) So he's saying, what are you doing? How could Jesus use Peter to build the church when he's the one that says, don't die so the church can be built? So how's he gonna use you? If he can't use Peter, how's he gonna use you? Well, we know he used Peter. How did he end up using Peter? Because he didn't, he he said this, watch. Jesus built his church on the submissiveness of Peter, not the ability of Peter. Amen. Amen. Amen? Jesus will build the blessings and the hope and the future on the submissiveness of you, not the ability of your decision making. So even though you stumble, as long as you call upon his name, he will pick you back up. Because as I'm preaching this message, some of you are saying, I hang out with the wrong people. I do the wrong thing. So what we all do. But you got to reach up, take the map out of your hand, put it back in Jesus' hands and say, you drive. I'm just going to submit, obey, and follow you. And he says, good, now I'll build the church for you. I'll build your life, I'll build your hope, and I'll build your future. I know the plans I have for you, not to harm you, but to give you hope and a future. As long as you do what I say, go where I say, leave who I say, lift your hand so that I can fight the battle instead of you taking it on head to head. And if you fall, that's okay, I understand that. Call upon my name, because when you call upon my name, you will humbly bow before me, and when you humbly bow before me and repent, I will see your submissiveness, I will raise you up, and I will continue to build your hope and your future amen that's all i got we don't want you to leave today without giving you an opportunity to follow jesus the bible says the only way to the father is through the son if you declare with your mouth that jesus is lord and believe that god raised him from the dead you will be saved we invite you to take a moment and ask god to forgive you and to help you follow him on this journey if you've made this decision today Make sure that you get into a church that teaches the Word of God. And remember to read the instruction manual. That's the Bible. If you're in the area, come visit us at any time. Check out times and location at orlandofamilychurch.com or at 407-462-1358. Hope to see you there.